For many, it's the issue of our age, the G word, globalization, the freeing up of trade between nations and continents, and across oceans and airspaces where protective barriers have been torn down. More trade means more wealth creation and greater prosperity for rich and poor alike, its supporters say. Why then, after a decade of radical liberalization, is so much of the world sinking into deeper and deeper poverty, while the rich nations get steadily richer? And why does the anti-globalization movement seem to have ignited the passion of so many, especially the young? My guest today is an evangelist for the G word, an economist, a former special advisor to the World Trade Organization, and the author of Open World, the truth about globalization. Philippe Legrain, welcome to Hard Talk. Uh, Naomi Klein, the now world-famous anti-globalization campaigner, says that uh, globalization itself is on trial precisely because it has failed to deliver the, pro the prosperity that those of you who support it promise. And she says that to trust free trade as you do to end poverty amounts to a zealous and near mystical faith in trickle-down economics. You seem to have locked horns with your entire generation. Well, I think Naomi Klein um, should actually look at the facts um, and look at the at, uh, people in the third world who are benefiting uh, from open trade. You see that in China over the past decade, 100 million people have been lifted out of poverty thanks to freer trade. That's the fastest fall in poverty the world has ever seen. You see countries like South Korea, which have gone from being you know, as poor as parts of Africa to be uh, on equivalent uh, living standards to those in Europe. That's a remarkable transformation, and it's thanks to globalization. So I think Naomi Klein should get her facts straight. But when you go to those very places you mentioned, Africa, parts of Asia, you see that the effect of uh, liberalization of uh, trade has been to create little islands of, if you like, first world economic activity, surrounded by a sea of poverty. And the experience of most people living nearby is that wealth is not trickling down, it's trickling out. Well, except that's, that's simply not true. I mean, you see that um, it starts uh, being localized and then it spreads more widely. I think South Korea, I said, is the best example. Uh, South Korea started with what these what now called sweatshops. Um, and now they make cars, they make ships. Uh, you go to Seoul and it feels like a first world city. And you go out in the countryside and, you know, it's not as rich as the city, but that's just true in lots of places. But it's, you know, basically first world. Uh, that is a transformation which has happened in 40 years. It's gone from being desperately poor and backward to being you know, an advanced economy, and that is thanks to free trade. But for every part of the world where free trade has delivered uh, what you describe, greater prosperity for most, there are parts of the world where it's had the effect of exacerbating poverty. I mean, in Latin America, for example, the rapid growth in exports that has accompanied uh, uh, free, uh, free freer trade is, is also accompanied by rising unemployment, stagnating incomes, and more people in poverty now in many parts than there were 10 years ago. I think you have to distinguish between uh, several things. Uh, the first is between free trade and uh, free movement of capital, free movement of money. Um, if you look at free trade, you see that uh, developing countries that are open to trade um, are growing around 5% a year at that kind of level. Uh, living standards double every 14 years. You see ones that are shut off from the world economy, uh, they're growing at 1.4% a year, which means it takes 50 years for living standards to double. Now, the countries that are globalizing and catching up, those that are not, um, are falling further behind the rich countries. Secondly, you see distinct from that a problem with opening up your capital markets too early. And I think the globalization is not an all or nothing package. Free trade is almost always a good thing. Free capital flows, if you're an underdeveloped uh, if you have an underdeveloped financial sector, uh, is not a good thing. You, you wrote recently that globalization comes with several options. We can, you said, to a large extent, pick and choose what kind of globalization we want. Well, it's not we who are pick, picking and choosing the citizens of this planet. In effect, globalization, as, exp as, ex as, it, as it's experienced in practice, has been picked and chosen by Washington. The so-called Washington consensus is being imposed uh, all around the world, isn't it? That's the reality. No, that's, that's simply not true. I mean, you have to look at the fact that across the world there's a remarkable uh, disparity or remarkable um, difference between uh, the different the policies that different countries are, are pursuing. Some are open to trade, some are not. Some are open to capital, some are not. Some have big governments, some have small governments. Some have lots of regulations, some have very little regulation. The idea that there is some sort of like uniform model which is being uh, imposed on the world uh, by the United States or anyone else is simply contradicted by the facts. I mean, they may find to get out more. What do you say to those people who point to the simple fact that the number of people living in dire poverty hasn't changed 
since 1987. And that's not according to Naomi Klein, that's according to The Economist, who, like, which, like you, is a great uh, evangelist for globalization. And that is, first of all, you see that in globalizing, country, globalizing countries, poverty has fallen, and that's the crucial point. And secondly, you see that there's been a huge increase in the world's population since 1987. So actually, uh, the share of people living in, in extreme poverty has fallen from 28% to 23% in a decade. Now, a decade is a very short period of time, over longer periods of time, as you see in places like South Korea, you get a transformation from extreme poverty to basically wealth. And that's incredible. I mean, it's never happened before in human history. Places like South Korea were written off. They were, you know, the same, same about China. You go to China now and you see parts of China which are as rich as, uh, you know, uh, poorer parts of Europe. That's incredible. The United Nations Development Program says that since the uh, WTO was brought into existence, the 48 least developed countries will be worse off by the year 2004 compared to 1995 by 600 million dollars sub-saharan africa even more why is that is it is what you're saying that there's they're not getting enough globalization well i mean you know there's a, there's a sort of misapprehension that somehow we live already in a world of of global free trade there are some countries which are open and there are some countries which are not um no country is 100 percent open uh, the closest to that is Estonia. Most countries, for example, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, are not open to trade at all. They have all sorts of restrictions. Um, plus, you have the fact that rich countries have barriers to uh, the exports of, of many of these uh, poor countries. So we don't operate in a world of free trade. We operate in a world of free trade in some areas and practiced by some countries. Uh, and you notice that in the areas where there is free trade, you see all the gains that you expect from it. You see that countries which are open to trade benefit. But you can't say that uh, just because there are some countries falling behind, uh, uh, that it's because of free trade and they're not practicing it. But you can see why, can't you? In, in many parts of the world, uh, the uh, so-called Washington Consensus looks not only deceptive, but actually bogus when uh, a small farmer in Africa, for example, a cotton farmer in West Africa or a fisherman in East Africa, uh, simply says, there's no point in expanding. I can't expand because nobody's prepared to buy my produce. Not even my own neighbors are prepared to buy my own produce because they can get uh, pro produce from the Northern Hemisphere cheaper than I can produce it here. And that's a problem of lack of globalization. It's a problem of the fact that uh, the rich countries uh, still impose uh, high import duties on agricultural go 